Chapter One of How It Flies or Conquest of the Air. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. How It Flies or Conquest of the Air by Richard Ferris. Chapter One Introductory The Sudden Awakening. Early Successes. Influence of the gasoline engine on airplanes, on dirigible balloons, interested inquiry, some general terms defined. In the year 1908, the world awakened suddenly to the realization that at last the centuries of man's endeavor to fly mechanically had come to successful fruition. There had been a little warning. In the late autumn of 1906, Santos Dumont made a flight of 720 feet in a power-driven machine. There was an exclamation of wonder, a burst of applause, then a relapse into unconcern. In August 1907, Louis Blériot sped free of the ground for 470 feet, and in November Santos Dumont made two flying leaps of barely 500 feet. That was the year's record, and it excited little comment. It is true that the Wright brothers had been making long flights, but they were in secret. There was no public knowledge of them. In 1908 came the revelation. In March, Delagrange flew in a voice and biplane 453 feet, carrying Farman with him as a passenger. Two weeks later, he flew alone nearly two and a half miles. In May, he flew nearly eight miles. In June, his best flight was ten and a half miles. Lariat came on the scene again in July with a monoplane in which he flew three and three quarters miles. In September, Delagrange flew 15 miles in less than 30 minutes. In the same month, the Wrights began their wonderful public flights. Wilbur, in France, made records of 41, 46, 62, and 77 miles, while Orville flew 40 to 50 miles at Fort Myer, Virginia. Wilbur Wright's longest flight kept him in the air 2 hours and 20 minutes. The goal had been reached. Men had achieved the apparently impossible. The whole world was roused to enthusiasm. Since then, progress has been phenomenally rapid. Urged on by the striving of the inventors, the competition of the aircraft builders, and the contests for records among the pilots. By far, the largest factor in the triumph of the airplane is the improved gasoline engine, designed originally for automobiles. Without this wonderful type of motor, delivering a maximum of power with a minimum of weight from concentrated fuel, the flying machine would still be resting on the ground. Nor has the influence of the gasoline motor been much less upon that other great class of aircraft, the dirigible balloon. After 1885, when Reynard and Krebs' airship La France made its two historic voyages from chalet Madon to Paris, returning safely to its shed under the propulsion of an electric motor, the problem of the great airship lay dormant, waiting for the discovery of adequate motive power. If the development of the dirigible balloon seems less spectacular than that of the airplane, it is because the latter had to be created. The dirigible, already in existence, had only to be revivified. Confronted with these new and strange shapes in the sky, some making stately journeys of hundreds of miles, others whirring hither and thither with the speed of the whirlwind, wonder quickly gave way to the all-absorbing question, how do they fly? To answer fully and satisfactorily, it seems wise for many readers to recall in the succeeding chapters some principles doubtless long since forgotten. As with every great advance in civilization, this expansion of the science of aeronautics has had its effect upon the language of the day. Terms formerly in use have become restricted in application, and other terms have been coined to convey ideas so entirely new as to find no suitable word existent in our language. It seems requisite, therefore, first to acquaint the reader with clear definitions of the more common terms that are used throughout this book. Aeronautics is the word employed to designate the entire subject of aerial navigation. An aeronaut is a person who sails or commands any form of aircraft, as distinguished from a passenger. Aviation is limited to the subject of flying by machines which are not floated in the air by gas. An aviator is an operator of such machine. Both aviators and aeronauts are often called pilots. A balloon is essentially an envelope or bag filled with some gaseous substance which is lighter, bulk for bulk, than the air at the surface of the earth. 
and which serves to float the apparatus in the air. In its usual form, it is spherical, with a car or basket suspended below it. It is a captive balloon if it is attached to the ground by a cable, so that it may not rise above a certain level, nor float away in the wind. It is a free balloon, if not so attached or anchored, but is allowed to drift where the wind may carry it, rising and falling at the will of the pilot. A dirigible balloon, sometimes termed simply a dirigible, usually has its gas envelope elongated in form. It is fitted with motive power to propel it and steering mechanism to guide it. It is distinctively the airship. Airplanes are those forms of flying machines which depend for their support in the air upon the spread of surfaces which are variously called wings, sails, or planes. They are commonly driven by propellers, actuated by motors. When not driven by power, they are called gliders. Airplanes exist in several types. The monoplane, with one spread of surface. The biplane, with two spreads, one above the other. The triplane, with three spreads, or decks. The multiplane, with more than three. The tetrahedral plane is a structure of many small cells set one upon another. Ornithopter is the name given to a flying machine which is operated by flapping wings. Helicopter is used to designate machines which are lifted vertically and sustained in the air by propellers revolving in a horizontal plane, as distinguished from the propellers of the aeroplane, which revolve in vertical planes. A parachute is an umbrella-like contrivance by which an aeronaut may descend gently from a balloon in mid-air, buoyed up by the compression of the air under the umbrella. For the definition of other and more technical terms, the reader is referred to the carefully prepared glossary toward the end of the book. End of chapter 1「How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air, by Richard Ferris. Chapter 2. The Air. The air about us seems the nearest approach to nothingness that we know of. A pail is commonly said to be empty, to have nothing in it, when it is filled only with air. This is because our senses do not give us any information about air. We cannot see it, hear it, touch it. When air is in motion, wind, we hear the noises it makes as it passes among other objects more substantial, and we feel it as it blows by us, or when we move rapidly through it. We get some idea that it exists as a substance when we see dead leaves caught up in it and whirled about, and, more impressively, when in the violence of the hurricane it seizes upon a body of great size and weight, like the roof of a house, and whisks it away as though it were a feather, at a speed exceeding that of the fastest railroad train. In a milder form, this invisible and intangible air does some of our work for us in at least two ways that are conspicuous. It moves ships upon the ocean, and it turns a multitude of windmills supplying the cheapest power known. That this atmosphere is really a fluid ocean, having a definite substance, and in some respects resembling the liquid ocean upon which our ships sail, and that we are only crawling around on the bottom of it, as it were, is a conception we do not readily grasp. Yet this conception must be the foundation of every effort to sail, to fly, in this aerial ocean, if such efforts are to be crowned with success. As a material substance, the air has certain physical properties, and it is the part of wisdom for the man who would fly to acquaint himself with these properties. If they are helpful to his flight, he wants to use them. If they hinder, he must contrive to overcome them. In general, it may be said that the air, being in a gaseous form, partakes of the properties of all gases, and these may be studied in any textbook on physics. Here we are concerned only with those qualities which affect conditions under which we strive to fly. Of first importance is the fact that air has weight. That is, in common with all other substances, it is attracted by the mass of the earth exerted through the force we call gravity. At the level of the sea, this attraction causes the air to press upon the earth with a weight of nearly 15 pounds, accurately 14.7 pounds, to the square inch, when the temperature is at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. That pressure is the weight of a column of air, 
one inch square at the base extending upward to the outer limit of the atmosphere estimated to be about thirty eight miles some say a hundred miles above sea level the practical fact is that normal human life cannot exist above the level of fifteen thousand feet or a little less than three miles and navigation of the air will doubtless be carried on at a much lower altitude for reasons which will appear as we continue the actual weight of a definite quantity of dry air for instance a cubic foot is found by weighing a vessel first when full of air and again after the air has been exhausted from it with an air pump in this way it has been determined that a cubic foot of dry air at the level of the sea and at a temperature of thirty two degrees fahrenheit weighs five hundred and sixty five grains about zero point zero eight zero seven pounds at a height above the level of the sea a cubic foot of air will weigh less than the figure quoted for its density decreases as we go upward the pressure being less owing to the diminished attraction of the earth at the greater distance for instance at the height of a mile above sea level a cubic foot of air will weigh about four hundred and thirty three grains or zero point zero six one nine pounds at the height of five miles it will weigh about two hundred and sixteen grains or zero point zero three zero nine pounds at thirty eight miles it will have no weight at all its density being so rare as just to balance the earth's attraction it has been calculated that the whole body of air above the earth if it were all of the uniform density of that at sea level would extend only to the height of twenty six thousand one hundred sixty six feet perhaps a clearer comprehension of the weight and pressure of the ocean of air upon the earth may be gained by recalling that the pressure of the thirty eight miles of atmosphere is just equal to balancing a column of water thirty three feet high the pressure of the air therefore is equivalent to the pressure of a flood of water thirty three feet deep but air is seldom dry it is almost always mingled with the vapor of water and this vapor weighs only three hundred and fifty two grains per cubic foot at sea level consequently the mixture damp air is lighter than dry air in proportion to the moisture it contains another fact very important to the aeronaut is that air is in constant motion owing to its ready expansion by heat a body of air occupying one cubic foot when at a temperature of thirty two degrees fahrenheit will occupy more space at a higher temperature and less space at a lower temperature hence heated air will flow upward until it reaches a point where the natural density of the atmosphere is the same as its expanded density due to the heating here another complication comes into play for ascending air is cooled at the rate of one degree for every one hundred and eighty three feet it rises and as it cools it grows denser and the speed of its ascension is thus gradually checked after passing an altitude of a thousand feet the decrease in temperature is one degree for every three hundred and twenty feet of ascent in general it may be stated that air is expanded one-tenth of its volume for each fifty degrees fahrenheit that its temperature is raised this highly unstable condition under ordinary changes of temperature causes continual movements in the air as different portions of it are constantly seeking that position in the atmosphere where their density at that moment balances the earth's attraction sir hiram maxim relates an incident which aptly illustrates the effect of change of temperature upon the air he says on one occasion many years ago i was present when a bonded warehouse in new york containing ten thousand barrels of alcohol was burned i walked completely around the fire and found things just as i expected the wind was blowing a perfect hurricane through every street in the direction of the fire although it was a dead calm everywhere else the flames mounted straight in the air to an enormous height and took with them a large amount of burning wood when i was fully five hundred feet from the fire a piece of partly burned one inch board about eight inches wide and four feet long fell through the air and landed near me this board had evidently been taken up to a great height by the tremendous uprush of air caused by the burning alcohol that which happened on a small scale with a violent change of temperature in the case of the alcohol fire is taking place on a larger scale with milder changes in temperature all over the world the heating by the sun in one locality causes an expansion of air at that place and cooler denser air rushes in to fill the partial vacuum 
In this way, winds are produced. So the air in which we are to fly is in a state of constant motion, which may be likened to the rush and swirl of water in the rapids of a mountain torrent. The tremendous difference is that the perils of the water are in plain sight of the navigator. It may be guarded against, while those of the air are wholly invisible and must be met as they occur, without a moment's warning. Next in importance to the aerial navigator is the air's resistance. This is due in part to its density at the elevation at which he is flying, and in part to the direction and intensity of its motion, or the wind. While this resistance is far less than that of water to the passage of a ship, it is of serious moment to the aeronaut, who must force his fragile machine through it at great speed, and be on the alert every instant to combat the possibility of a fall as he passes into a rarer and less buoyant stratum. Three properties of the air enter into the sum total of its resistance. Inertia, elasticity, and viscosity. Inertia is its tendency to remain in the condition in which it may be, at rest if it is still, in motion if it is moving. Some force must be applied to disturb this inertia, and in consequence, when the inertia is overcome, a certain amount of force is used up in the operation. Elasticity is that property by virtue of which air tends to reoccupy its normal amount of space after disturbance. An illustration of this tendency is the springing back of the handle of a bicycle pump if the valve at the bottom is not open, and the air in the pump is simply compressed, not forced into the tire. Viscosity may be described as stickiness, the tendency of the particles of air to cling together, to resist separation. To illustrate, molasses, particularly in cold weather, has greater viscosity than water. Varnish has greater viscosity than turpentine. Air exhibits some viscosity, though vastly less than that of cold molasses. However, though relatively slight, this viscosity has a part in the resistance which opposes the rapid flight of the airship and airplane, and the higher the speed, the greater the retarding effect of viscosity. The inertia of the air, while in some degree it blocks the progress of his machine, is a benefit to the aeronaut, for it is inertia which gives the blades of his propeller hold upon the air. The elasticity of the air, compressed under the curved surfaces of the airplane, is believed to be helpful in maintaining the lift. The effect of viscosity may be greatly reduced by using surfaces finished with polished varnish, just as greasing a knife will permit it to be passed with less friction through thick molasses. In the case of winds, the inertia of the moving mass becomes what is commonly termed wind pressure against any object not moving with it at an equal speed. The following table gives the measurements of wind pressure, as recorded at the station on the Eiffel Tower, for differing velocities of wind. There follows in the text a table listing velocity in miles per hour, velocity in feet per second, and pressure in pounds on a square foot for a range of velocities from 2 to 100 miles per hour. In applying this table, the velocity to be considered is the net velocity of the movements of the airship and of the wind. If the ship is moving 20 miles an hour against a headwind blowing 20 miles an hour, the net velocity of the wind will be 40 miles an hour, and the pressure 4.8 pounds a square foot of surface presented. Therefore, the airship will be standing still, so far as objects on the ground are concerned. If the ship is sailing 20 miles an hour with the wind, which is blowing 20 miles an hour, the pressure per square foot will be only 1.2 pounds, while as regards objects on the ground, the ship will be traveling 40 miles an hour. Systematic study of the movement of the air currents has not been widespread and has not progressed much beyond the gathering of statistics which may serve as useful data in testing existing theories or forming new ones. It is already recognized that there are certain tides in the atmosphere recurring twice daily in six-hour periods, as in the case of the ocean tides, and perhaps from the same causes. Other currents are produced by the Earth's rotation. Then there are the five-day oscillations noted by Elliot in India, and daily movements more or less regular due to the sun's heat by day and the lack of it by night. The complexity of these motions makes scientific research extremely difficult. Something definite has been accomplished in the determination of wind velocities, though this varies largely with the locality. 
in the united states the average speed of the winds is nine and a half miles per hour in europe ten and a third miles in southern asia six and a half miles in the west indies six and a fifth miles in england twelve miles over the north atlantic ocean twenty nine miles per hour each of these average velocities varies with the time of year and time of day and with the distance from the sea the wind moves faster over water and flat bare land than over hilly or forest covered areas velocities increase as we go upward in the air being at sixteen hundred feet twice what they are at one hundred feet observations of the movements of cloud forms at the blue hill observatory near boston give the following results stratus clouds at a height of one thousand six hundred and seventy six feet have an average speed of nineteen miles per hour cumulus clouds at a height of five thousand three hundred and twenty six feet have an average speed of twenty four miles per hour alto cumulus clouds at a height of twelve thousand seven hundred and twenty four feet have an average speed of thirty four miles per hour cirro cumulus clouds at a height of twenty one thousand eight hundred and eighty eight feet have an average speed of seventy one miles per hour cirrus clouds at a height of twenty thousand three hundred and seventeen feet have an average speed of seventy eight miles per hour in winter the speed of cirrus clouds may reach ninety six miles per hour there are forty nine stations scattered over germany where statistics concerning wind are gathered expressly for the use of aeronauts at many of these stations records have been kept for twenty years dr richard osman director of the aerological observatory at lindenburg has prepared a comprehensive treatise of the statistics in possession of these stations under the title of die wind in deutschland it shows for each station and for each season of the year how often the wind blows from each point of the compass the average frequency of the several degrees of wind when and where aerial voyages may safely be made the probable drift of dirigibles etc it is interesting to note that friedrichshafen where count zeppelin's great airship sheds are located is not a favorable place for such vessels having a yearly record of twenty-four stormy days as compared with but two stormy days at Celle, four at berlin four at cassel and low records at several other points in practical aviation a controlling factor is the density of the air we have seen that at an altitude of five miles the density is about three-eighths the density at sea level this means that the supporting power of the air at a five-mile elevation is so small that the area of the planes must be increased to more than two and a half times the area suited for flying near the ground or that the speed must be largely increased therefore the adjustments necessary for rising at the lower level and journeying in the higher level are too large and complex to make flying at high altitudes practicable leaving out of consideration the bitter cold of the upper regions mr a lawrence roch director of the blue hill observatory in his valuable book the conquest of the air gives this practical summary of a long series of studious observations at night however because there are no ascending currents the wind is much steadier than in the daytime making night the most favorable time for aerial navigation of all kinds a suitable height in the daytime unless a strong westerly wind is sought lies above the cumulus clouds at the height of about a mile but at night it is not necessary to rise so high and in summer a region of relatively little wind is found at a height of about three-fourths of a mile where it is also warmer and drier than in the daytime or at the ground notwithstanding all difficulties the fact remains that once they are overcome the air is the ideal highway for travel and transportation on the sea a ship may sail to right or left on one plane only in the air we may steer not only to right or left but above and below and obliquely in innumerable planes we shall not need to traverse long distances in a wrong direction to find a bridge by which we may cross a river nor a zigzag for toilsome miles up the steep slopes of a mountain side to the pass where we may cross the divide the course of the airship is the proverbial bee line the most economical in time as well as in distance end of chapter two
Chapter Three of How It Flies or Conquest of the Air. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How It Flies or Conquest of the Air by Richard Ferris. Chapter Three Laws of Flight. If we were asked to explain the word flying to some foreigner who did not know what it meant, we should probably give as an illustration the bird this would be because the bird is so closely associated in our thoughts with flying that we can hardly think of the one without the other it is natural therefore that since men first had the desire to fly they should study the form and motion of the birds in the air and try to copy them our ancestors built immense flopping wings into the frames of which they fastened themselves and with great muscular exertion of arms and legs strove to attain the results that the bird gets by apparently similar motions however this mental coupling of the bird with the laws of flight has been unfortunate for the achievement of flight by man and this is true even to the present day with its hundreds of successful flying machines that are not in the least like a bird this wrongly coupled idea is so strong that scientific publications print pages of research by eminent contributors into the flight of birds with the attempt to deduce lessons therefrom for the instruction of the builders and navigators of flying machines these arguments are based on the belief that nature never makes a mistake that she made the bird to fly and therefore the bird must be the most perfect model for the successful flying machine but the truth is the bird was not made primarily to fly any more than man was made to walk flying is an incident in the life of a bird just as walking is an incident in the life of a man flying is simply a bird's way of getting about from place to place on business or on pleasure as the case may be santos dumont in his fascinating book my airships points out the folly of blindly following nature by showing that logically such a procedure would compel us to build our locomotives on the plan of gigantic horses with huge iron legs which would go galloping about the country in a ridiculously terrible fashion and to construct our steamships on the plan of giant whales with monstrous flapping fins and wildly lashing tails sir hiram maxim says something akin to this in his work artificial and natural flight Quote, it appears to me that there is nothing in nature which is more efficient or gets a better grip on the water than a well-made screw propeller and no doubt there would have been fish with screw propellers providing dame nature could have made an animal in two pieces it is very evident that no living creature could be made in two pieces and two pieces are necessary if one part is stationary and the other revolves however the tail and fins very often approximate to the action of propeller blades they first turn to the right and then to the left producing a sculling effect which is practically the same this argument might also be used against locomotives in all nature we do not find an animal travelling on wheels but it is quite possible that a locomotive might be made that would walk on legs at the rate of two or three miles an hour but locomotives with wheels are able to travel at least three times as fast as the fleetest animal with legs and to continue doing so for many hours at a time even when attached to a very heavy load in order to build a flying machine with flapping wings to exactly imitate birds a very complicated system of levers cams cranks etc would have to be employed and these of themselves would weigh more than the wings would be able to lift End quote as with the man-contrived locomotive so the perfected airship will be evolved from man's understanding of the obstacles to his navigation of the air and his overcoming of them by his inventive genius this will not be in nature's way but in man's own way and with cleverly designed machinery such as he has used to accomplish other seeming impossibilities with the clearing up of wrong conceptions the path will be open to more rapid and more enduring progress when we consider the problems of flying the first obstacle we encounter is the attraction which the earth has for us and for all other objects on its surface this we call weight and we are accustomed to measure it in pounds let us take for example a man whose body is attracted by the earth 
with a force or weight of one hundred and fifty pounds to enable him to rise into the air means must be contrived not only to counteract his weight but to lift him a force a little greater than one hundred and fifty pounds must be exerted we may attach to him a bag filled with some gas as hydrogen for which the earth has less attraction than it has for air and which the air will push out of the way and upward until a place above the earth is reached where the attraction of air and gas is equal a bag of gas large enough to be pushed upward with a force equal to the weight of the man plus the weight of the bag and a little more for lifting power will carry the man up this is the principle of the ordinary balloon rising in the air is not flying it is a necessary step but real flying is to travel from place to place through the air to accomplish this some mechanism or machinery is needed to propel the man after he has been lifted into the air such machinery will have weight and the bag of gas must be enlarged to counterbalance it when this is done the man and the bag of gas may move through the air and with suitable rudders he may direct his course this combination of the lifting bag of gas and the propelling machinery constitutes a dirigible balloon or airship the airship is affected equally with the balloon by prevailing winds a breeze blowing ten miles an hour will carry a balloon at nearly that speed in the direction in which it is blowing suppose the aeronaut wishes to sail in the opposite direction if the machinery will propel his airship only ten miles an hour in a calm it will virtually stand still in the ten mile breeze if the machinery will propel his airship twenty miles an hour in a calm the ship will travel ten miles an hour as related to places on the earth's surface against the wind but so far as the air is concerned his speed through it is twenty miles an hour and each increase of speed meets increased resistance from the air and requires a greater expenditure of power to overcome to reduce this resistance to the least possible amount the globular form of the early balloon has been variously modified most modern airships have a cigar-shaped gas bag so called because the ends look like the tip of a cigar as far as is known this is the balloon that offers less resistance to the air than any other another mechanical means of getting up into the air was suggested by the flying of kites a pastime dating back at least two thousand years perhaps longer ordinarily a kite will not fly in a calm but with even a little breeze it will mount into the air by the upward thrust of the rushing breeze against its inclined surface being prevented from blowing away drifting by the pull of the kite string the same effect will be produced in a dead calm if the operator holding the string runs at a speed equal to that of the breeze with this important difference not only will the kite rise in the air but it will travel in the direction in which the operator is running a part of the energy of the runner's pull upon the string producing a forward motion provided he holds the string taut if we suppose the pull on the string to be replaced by an engine and revolving propeller in the kite exerting the same force we have exactly the principle of the aeroplane as it is of the greatest importance to possess a clear understanding of the natural processes we propose to use let us refer to any textbook on physics and review briefly some of the natural laws relating to motion and force which apply to the problem of flight a force is that power which changes or tends to change the position of a body whether it is in motion or at rest b a given force will produce the same effect whether the body on which it acts is acted upon by that force alone or by other forces at the same time c a force may be represented graphically by a straight line the point at which the force is applied being the beginning of the line the direction of the force being expressed by the direction of the line and the magnitude of the force being expressed by the length of the line d two or more forces acting upon a body are called component forces and the single force which would produce the same effect is called the resultant e when two component forces act in different directions the resultant may be found by applying the principle of the parallelogram of forces 
the lines c representing the components being made adjacent sides of a parallelogram and the diagonal drawn from the included angle representing the resultant in direction and magnitude f conversely a resultant motion may be resolved into its components by constructing a parallelogram upon it as the diagonal either one of the components being known taking up again the illustration of the kite flying in a calm let us construct a few diagrams to show graphically the forces at work upon the kite let the heavy line a b represent the centre line of the kite from top to bottom and c the point where the string is attached at which point we may suppose all the forces concentrate their action upon the plane of the kite obviously as the flyer of the kite is running in a horizontal direction the line indicating the pull of the string is to be drawn horizontal let it be expressed by c d the action of the air pressure being at right angles to the plane of the kite we draw the line c e representing that force but as this is a pressing force at the point c we may express it as a pulling force on the other side of the kite by the line c f equal to c e and in the opposite direction another force acting on the kite is its weight the attraction of gravity acting directly downward shown by c g we have given therefore the three forces c d c f and c g we now wish to find the value of the pull on the kite string c d in two other forces one of which shall be a lifting force acting directly upward and the other a propelling force acting in the direction in which we desire the kite to travel supposing it to represent an aeroplane for the moment we first construct a parallelogram on c f and c g and draw the diagonal c h which represents the resultant of those two forces we have then the two forces c d and c h acting on the point c to avoid obscuring the diagram with too many lines we draw a second figure showing just these two forces acting on the point c upon these we construct a new parallelogram and draw the diagonal c i expressing their resultant again drawing a new diagram showing this single force c i acting upon the point c we resolve that force into two components one c j vertically upward representing the lift the other c k horizontal representing the travelling power if the lines expressing these forces in the diagrams had been accurately drawn to scale the measurement of the two components last found would give definite results in pounds but the weight of a kite is too small to be thus diagrammed and only the principle was to be illustrated to be used later in the discussion of the aeroplane nor is the problem as simple as the illustration of the kite suggests for the air is compressible and is moreover set in motion in the form of a current by a body passing through it at anything like the ordinary speed of an aeroplane this has caused the curving of the planes from front to rear of the flying machine in contrast with the flat plane of the kite the reasoning is along this line suppose the main plane of an aeroplane six feet in depth from front to rear to be passing rapidly through the air inclined upward at a slight angle by the time two feet of this step has passed a certain point the air at that point will have received a downward impulse or compression which will tend to make it flow in the direction of the angle of the plane the second and third divisions in the depth each of two feet will therefore be moving with a partial vacuum beneath the air having been drawn away by the first segment at the same time the pressure of the air from above remains the same and the result is that only the front edge of the plane is supported while two-thirds of its depth is pushed down this condition not only reduces the supporting surface to that of a plane two feet in depth but what is much worse releases a tipping force which tends to throw the plane over backward in order that the second section of the plane may bear upon the air beneath it with a pressure equal to that of the first it must be inclined downward at double the angle with the horizon of the first section this will in turn give to the air beneath it a new direction the third section of the plane must then be set at a still deeper angle to give it support 
connecting these several directions with a smoothly flowing line without angles we get the curved line of section to which the main planes of aeroplanes are bent with these principles in mind it is in order to apply them to the understanding of how an aeroplane flies wilbur wright when asked what kept his machine up in the air why it did not fall to the ground replied it stays up because it doesn't have time to fall just what he meant by this is illustrated by referring to the common sport of skipping stones upon the surface of still water a flat stone is selected and it is thrown at a high speed so that the flat surface touches the water it continues skipping again and again until its speed is so reduced that the water where it touches last has time to get out of the way and the weight of the stone carries it to the bottom on the same principle a person skating swiftly across very thin ice will pass safely over it if he goes so fast that the ice hasn't time to break and give way beneath his weight this explains why an aeroplane must move swiftly to stay up in the air which has much less density than either water or ice the minimum speed at which an aeroplane can remain in the air depends largely upon its weight the heavier it is the faster it must go just as a large man must move faster over thin ice than a small boy at some aviation contests prizes have been awarded for the slowest speed made by an aeroplane so far the slowest on record is that of twenty one point two nine miles an hour made by captain dixon at the lanark meet scotland in august nineteen ten as the usual rate of speed is about forty six miles an hour that is slow for an aeroplane and as dixon's machine is much heavier than some others the curtis machine for instance it is remarkably slow for that type of aeroplane just what is to be gained by offering a prize for slowest speed is difficult to conjecture it is like offering a prize to a crowd of boys for the one who can skate slowest over thin ice the minimum speed is the most dangerous with the aeroplane as with the skater other things being equal the highest speed is the safest for an aeroplane even when his engine stops in mid-air the aviator is compelled to keep up speed sufficient to prevent a fall by gliding swiftly downward until the very moment of landing the air surface necessary to float a plane is spread out in one area in the monoplane and divided into two areas one above the other and six to nine feet apart in the biplane if closer than this the disturbance of the air by the passage of one plane affects the supporting power of the other it has been suggested that better results in the line of carrying power would be secured by so placing the upper plane that its front edge is a little back of the rear edge of the lower plane in order that it may enter air that is wholly free from any currents produced by the rushing of the lower plane as yet there is a difference of opinion among the principal aeroplane builders as to where the propeller should be placed all of the monoplanes have it in front of the main plane most of the biplanes have it behind the main plane some have it between the two planes if it is in front it works in undisturbed air but throws its weight upon the plane if it is in the rear the air is full of currents caused by the passage of the planes but the planes have smooth air to glide in as both types of machine are eminently successful the question may not be so important as it seems to the disputants the exact form of curve for the planes has not been decided upon experience has proven that of two aeroplanes having the same surface and run at the same speed one may be able to lift twice as much as the other because of the better curvature of its planes the action of the air when surfaces are driven through it is not fully understood indeed the form of plane shown in the accompanying figure is called the aeroplane paradox if driven in either direction it leaves the air with a downward trend and therefore exerts a proportional lifting power if half of the plane is taken away the other half is pressed downward all of the lifting effect is in the curving of the top side it seems desirable therefore that such essential factors should be thoroughly worked out understood and applied End of chapter three Chapter 4 of How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air by Richard Ferris Chapter 4 Flying Machines the term flying machines is applied to all forms of aircraft which are heavier than air and which lift and sustain themselves in the air by mechanical means. In this respect they are distinguished from balloons, which are lifted and sustained in the air by the lighter than air gas which they contain. From the earliest times the desire to fly in the air has been one of the strong ambitions of the human race. Even the prehistoric mythology of the ancient Greeks reflected the idea in the story of Icarus, who flew so near the sun that the heat melted the wax which fastened his wings to his body, and he fell into the sea. Perhaps the first historical record in the line of mechanical flight worthy of attention exists in the remarkable sketches and plans for a flying mechanism left by Leonardo da Vinci at his death in 1519. He had followed the model of the flying bird as closely as possible, although when the wings were outspread they had an outline more like those of the bat while extremely ingenious in the arrangement of the levers the power necessary to move them fast enough to lift the weight of a man was far beyond the muscular strength of any human being it was a century later in sixteen seventeen that veranzio a venetian proved his faith in his inventive ability by leaping from a tower in venice with a crude parachute-like contrivance he alighted without injury. In 1684, an Englishman, John Wilkins, then Bishop of Chester, built a machine for flying in which he installed a steam engine. No record exists of its performance. In 1678, a French locksmith by the name of Besnier devised what seems now a very crude apparatus for making descending flights, or glides, from elevated points. It was, however, at that date considered important enough to be described in the journal of the savants it was a wholly unscientific combination of the dog paddle motion in swimming with wing areas which collapsed on the upward motion and spread out on the downward thrust if it was ever put to a test it must have failed completely in seventeen forty two the marquis de Bacqueville constructed an apparatus which some considered to have been based on besnier's idea which seems rather doubtful he fastened the surfaces of his airplane directly to his arms and legs and succeeded in making a long glide from the window of his mansion across the garden of the tuileries alighting upon a washerwoman's bench in the seine without injury pockton the mathematician is credited with the suggestion of a flying machine with two screw propellers which he called terrafors a horizontal one to raise the machine into the air and an upright one to propel it these were to be driven by hand with such hopelessly inadequate power it is not surprising that nothing came of it yet the plan was a foreshadowing of the machine which has in these days achieved success the abbe de forget gained a place in the annals of aeronautics by inventing a flying machine of which only the name orthopter remains about seventeen eighty carl friedrich mirwein an architect and the inspector of public buildings for baden germany made many scientific calculations and experiments on the size of wing surface needed to support a man in the air he used the wild duck as a standard and figured that a surface of a hundred and twenty six square feet would sustain a man in the air this agrees with the later calculations of such experimenters as lilienthal and langley other of mirwine's conclusions are decidedly ludicrous he held that the build of a man favors a horizontal position in flying, as his nostrils open in a direction which would be away from the wind, and so respiration would not be interfered with. Some of his reasoning is unaccountably astray, as, for instance, his argument that because the man hangs in the wings, the weight of the latter need not be considered. It is almost needless to say that his practical trials were a total failure. The next prominent step forward toward mechanical flight was made by the Australian watchmaker Dagan, who balanced his wing surfaces with a small gas balloon. His first efforts to fly not being successful, he abandoned his invention and took to ballooning. Stencil, an engineer in Hamburg, came next with a machine in the form of a gigantic butterfly. From tip to tip of its wings, it measured twenty feet, and their depth fore and aft was five and a half feet. 
the ribs of the wings were of steel and the web of silk and they were slightly concave on the lower side the rudder tail was of two intersecting planes one vertical and the other horizontal it was operated by a carbonic acid motor and made eighty four flaps of the wings per minute the rush of air it produced was so great that anyone standing near it would be almost swept off his feet it did not reach a stage beyond the model for it was able to lift only seventy five pounds in eighteen forty three the english inventor henson built what is admitted to be the first airplane driven by motive power it was a hundred feet in breadth spread and thirty feet long and covered with silk the front edge was turned slightly upward it had a rudder shape like the tail of a bird it was driven by two propellers run by a twenty horsepower engine henson succeeded only in flying on a downgrade doubtless because of the upward bend of the front of his plane later investigations have proven that the upper surface of the airplane must be convex to gain the lifting effect this is one of the paradoxes of flying planes which no one has been able to explain in eighteen forty five von dreiberg in germany revived the sixteenth-century ideas of flying with the quite original argument that since the legs of man were better developed muscularly than his arms flying should be done with the legs he built a machine on this plan but no successful flights were recorded in eighteen sixty eight an experimenter by the name of winheim added to the increasing sum of aeronautical knowledge by discovering that the lifting power of a large supporting surface may be as well secured by a number of small surfaces placed one above another following up these experiments he built a flying machine with a series of six supporting planes made of linen fabric as he depended upon muscular effort to work his propellers he did not succeed in flying but he gained information which has been valuable to later inventors the history of flying machines cannot be written without deferential mention of horatio phillips of england the machine that he made in eighteen sixty two resembled a large venetian blind nine feet high and over twenty one feet long it was mounted on a carriage which traveled on a circular track six hundred feet long and it was driven by a small steam engine turning a propeller it lifted unusually heavy loads although not large enough to carry a man it seems to open the way for experiments with an entirely new arrangement of sustaining surfaces one that has never since been investigated phillips records cover a series of most valuable experiments perhaps his most important work was in the determination of the most advantageous form for the surfaces of airplanes and his researches into the correct proportion of motive power to the area of such surfaces much of his results have not yet been put to practical use by designers of flying machines the year eighteen eighty eight was marked by the construction by sir hiram maxim of his great airplane which weighed three and one-half tons and is said to have cost over a hundred thousand dollars the area of the planes was three thousand eight hundred and seventy five square feet and it was propelled by a steam engine in which the fuel used was vaporized naphtha in a burner having seventy five hundred jets under a boiler of small copper water tubes with a steam pressure of three hundred and twenty pounds per square inch the two compound engines each developed a hundred and eighty horsepower and each turned a two-bladed propeller seventeen and a half feet in diameter the machine was used only in making tests being prevented from rising the air by a restraining track the thrust developed on trial was two thousand one hundred and sixty four pounds and the lifting power was shown to have been in excess of ten thousand pounds the restraining track was torn to pieces and the machine injured by the fragments the dynamometer record proved that a dead weight of four and a half tons in addition to the weight of the machine and the crew of four men could have been lifted the stability speed and steering control were not tested sir hiram maxim made unnumbered experiments with models gaining information which has been invaluable in the development of the airplane the experiments of otto lilienthal in gliding with a winged structure were being conducted at this period he held that success in flying must be founded upon proficiency in the art of balancing the apparatus in the air he made innumerable glides from heights which he continually increased until he was traveling distances of nearly one-fourth of a mile from an elevation of a hundred feet he had reached the point where he was ready to install motive power to drive his glider when he met with a fatal accident 
besides the inspiration of his daring personal experiments in the air he left a most valuable series of records and calculations which have been of the greatest aid to other inventors in the line of artificial flight in eighteen ninety six professor langley director of the smithsonian institute at washington made a test of a model flying machine which was the result of years of experimenting it had a span of fifteen feet and a length of eight and a half feet without the extended rudder there were four sails or planes two on each side thirty inches in width for and aft measurement two propellers revolving in opposite directions were driven by a steam engine the diameter of the propellers was three feet and the steam pressure a hundred and fifty pounds per square inch the weight of the machine was twenty eight pounds it is said to have made a distance of one mile in one minute forty five seconds as professor langley's experiments were conducted in strict secrecy no authoritative figures are in existence later a larger machine was built which was intended to carry a man it had a spread of forty six feet and was thirty five feet in length it was four years in building and cost about fifty thousand dollars in the first attempt to launch it from the roof of a houseboat it plunged into the potomac river the explanation given was that the launching apparatus was defective this was remedied and a second trial made but the same result followed it was never tried again this machine was really a double or a tandem monoplane the framework was built of steel tubing almost as thin as writing paper every rib and pulley was hollowed out to reduce the weight the total weight of the engine and machine was eight hundred pounds and the supporting surface of the wings was one thousand forty square feet the airplane now in use averages from two to four pounds weight to the square foot of sustaining surface about the same time the french electrician otter after years of experimenting with the financial aid of the french government made some secret trials of his machine which had taken five years to build it had two bat-like wings spreading fifty-four feet and was propelled by two screws driven by a four-cylinder steam engine which has been described as a marvel of lightness the inventor claimed that he was able to rise to a height of sixty feet and that he made flights of several hundred yards the official tests however were unsatisfactory and nothing further was done by either the inventor or the government to continue the experiments the report was that in every trial the machine had been wrecked the experiments of lilienthal had excited an interest in his ideas which his untimely death did not abate among others a young english marine engineer percy s pilcher took up the problem of gliding flight and by the device of using the power exerted by running boys with a fivefold multiplying gear he secured speed enough to float his glider horizontally in the air for some distance he then built an engine which he purposed to install as motive power but before this was done he was killed by a fall from his machine while in the air before the death of Lilienthal, his efforts had attracted the attention of Octave Chanute, a distinguished civil engineer of Chicago, who, believing that the real problem of the glider was the maintenance of equilibrium in the air, instituted a series of experiments along that line. Lilienthal had preserved his equilibrium by moving his body about as he hung suspended under the wings of his machine. Chanute proposed to accomplish the same end by moving the wings automatically his attempts were partially successful he constructed several types of gliders one of these with two decks exactly in the form of the present biplane others had three or more decks upward of seven hundred glides were made with chunnitz machines by himself and assistants without a single accident it is of interest to note that a month before the fatal accident to lilienthal chunnitz had condemned that form of glider as unsafe in eighteen ninety seven a m herring who had been one of the foremost assistants of Octave Chanute, built a double-deck, biplane, machine, and equipped it with a gasoline motor between the planes. The engine failed to produce sufficient power, and an engine operated by compressed air was tried, but without the desired success. In 1898, Lawrence Hargrave of Sydney, New South Wales, came into prominence as the inventor of the cellular, or box kite. Following the researches of Chanute, he made a series of experiments upon the path of air currents under various curved surfaces and constructed some kites which under certain conditions would advance against a wind believed to be absolutely horizontal from these results hargrave was led to assert that 
soaring sails might be used to furnish propulsion not only for flying machines but also for ships in the ocean sailing against the wind the principles involved remain in obscurity during the years nineteen hundred to nineteen o three the brothers wright of dayton ohio had been experimenting with gliders among the sand dunes of kitty hawk north carolina a small hamlet on the atlantic coast they had gone there because the government meteorological department had informed them that at kitty hawk the winds blew more steadily than at any other locality in the united states toward the end of the summer of nineteen o three they decided that the time was ripe for the installation of motive power and on december seventeenth nineteen o three they made their first four flights under power the longest being eight hundred and fifty three feet in fifty nine seconds against a wind blowing nearly twenty miles an hour and from a starting point on level ground during nineteen o four over one hundred flights were made and changes in construction necessary to sail in circles were devised in nineteen o five the wrights kept on secretly with their practice and development of their machine first one and then the other making the flights until both were equally proficient in the latter part of september and early part of october nineteen o five occurred a series of flights which the wrights allowed to become known to the public at a meeting of the aeronautical society of great britain held in london on december fifteenth nineteen o five a letter from orville wright to one of the members was read it was dated november seventeenth nineteen o five and an excerpt from it is as follows during the month of september we gradually improved in our practice and on the twenty sixth made a flight of a little over eleven miles on the thirtieth we increased this to twelve and a fifth miles on october third to fifteen and a third miles on October 4th to 20 and 3 quarters miles, and on October 5th to 24 and a quarter miles. All these flights were made at about 38 miles an hour, the flight on October 5th occupying 30 minutes 3 seconds. Landings were caused by the exhaustion of the supply of fuel in the flights of September 26th and 30th and October 8th, and in those of October 3rd and 4th by the heating of the bearings in the transmission of which the oil cups had been omitted but before the flight of october fifth oil cups had been fitted to all the bearings and the small gasoline can had been replaced with one that carried enough fuel for an hour's flight unfortunately we neglected to refill the reservoir just before starting and as a result the flight was limited to thirty-eight minutes the machine passed through all of these flights without the slightest damage in each of these flights we returned frequently to the starting point passing high over the heads of the spectators these statements were received with incredulity in many parts of Europe, the more so as the Wrights refused to permit an examination of their machine, fearing that the details of construction might become known before their patents were secured. During the summer of 1905, Captain Ferber and Ernest Archdeacon of Paris had made experiments with gliders. One of the Archdeacon machines was towed by an automobile, having a bag of sand to occupy the place of the pilot it rose satisfactorily in the air but the tail became disarranged and it fell and was damaged it was rebuilt and tried upon the waters of the seine being towed by a fast motor boat at a speed of twenty five miles an hour the machine rose about fifty feet into the air and sailed for about five hundred feet archdeacon gathered a company of young men about him who speedily became imbued with his enthusiasm among them were gabriel voison louis Blériot and leon de la grange the two former working together built and flew several gliders and when santos dumont made his historic flight of seven hundred and twenty feet with his multiple cell machine on november thirteenth nineteen o six the first flight made in europe they were spurred to new endeavors within a few months voison had finished his first biplane and de la grange made his initial flight with it a mere hop of thirty feet on march sixteenth nineteen o seven Lariat, however, had his own ideas, and on August 6, 1907, he flew for 470 feet in a monoplane machine of the tandem type. He succeeded in steering his machine on a curved course, a feat which had not previously been accomplished in Europe. In October of the same year, Henri Farman, then a well-known automobile driver, flew the second voice on biplane in a half circle of 253 feet, a notable achievement at that date but santos dumont had been pushing forward several different types of machines and in november he flew first a biplane five hundred feet and a few days later a monoplane four hundred feet 
At this point in our story, the past seems to give place to the present. The period of early development was over, and the year 1908 saw the first of those remarkable exploits, which are recorded in the chapter near the end of this work, entitled Chronicle of Aviation Achievements. It is interesting to note that the machines then brought out are those of today. Practically, it may be said that there has been no material change from the original types. More powerful engines have been put in them, and the frame strengthened in proportion, but the Voisin, the Blériot, and the Wright types remain as they were at first. Other and later forms are largely modifications and combinations of their peculiar features. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air, by Richard Ferris. Chapter 5. Flying Machines. The Biplane. In the many contests for prizes and records, two types of flying machines have won distinctive places for themselves, the biplane and the monoplane. The appearance of other forms has been sporadic, and they have speedily disappeared without accomplishing anything which had not been better done by the two classes named. This fact, however, should not be construed as proving the futility of all other forms, nor that the ideal flying machine must be of one of these two prominent types. It is to be remembered that record-making and record-breaking is the most serious business in which any machines have so far been engaged, and this, surely, is not the field of usefulness to humanity which the ships of the air may be expected ultimately to occupy. It may yet be proved that, successful as these machines have been and what they have attempted, they are but transition forms leading up to the perfect airship of the future. The distinguishing feature of the biplane is not alone that it has two main planes, but that they are placed one above the other. The double, or tandem, monoplane also has two main planes, but they are on the same level, one in the rear of the other. A review of the notable biplanes of the day must begin with the Wright machine, which was not only the first with which flights were made, but also the inspiration, and perhaps the pattern, of the whole succeeding fleet. The Wright biplane. The Wright biplane is a structure composed of two main surfaces, each 40 feet long and 6 feet 6 inches wide, set one above the other, parallel, and 6 feet apart. The planes are held rigidly at this distance by struts of wood, and the whole structure is trussed with diagonal wire ties. It is claimed by the Wrights that these dimensions have been proven by their experiments to give the maximum lift with the minimum weight. The combination of planes is mounted on two rigid skids, or runners, similar to the runners of a sleigh, which are extended forward and upward to form a support for a pair of smaller planes in parallel, used as the elevator, for directing the course of the aeroplane upward or downward. It has been claimed by the Wrights that a rigid skid understructure takes up the shock of landing, and checks the momentum at that moment better than any other device. But it necessitated a separate starting apparatus, and while the starting impulse thus received enabled the Wrights to use an engine of less power, to keep the machine going when once started, and therefore of less dead weight, it proved a handicap to their machines in contests where they were met by competing machines which started directly with their own power. A later model of the Wright biplane is provided with a wheeled running gear and an engine of sufficient power to raise it in the air after a short run on the wheels. Two propellers are used, run by one motor. They are built of wood, are of the two-bladed type, and are of comparatively large diameter, 8 feet. They revolve in opposite directions at a speed of 450 revolutions per minute, being geared down by chain drive from the engine speed of 1,500 revolutions per minute. The large elevator planes in front have been a distinctive feature of the Wright machine. They have a combined area of 80 square feet, adding that much more lifting surface to the planes in ascending, for then the underside of their surfaces is exposed to the wind. If the same surfaces were in the rear of the main planes, their top sides would have to be turned to the wind when ascending, and a depressing instead of a lifting effect would result. To the rear of the main planes is a rudder composed of two parallel vertical surfaces for steering to right or left. The feature essential to the right biplane, 
upon which the letters patent were granted, is the flexible construction of the tips of the main planes, in virtue of which they may be warped up or down to restore disturbed equilibrium, or when a turn is to be made. This warping of the planes changes the angle of incidence for the part of the plane which is bent. The angle of incidence is that which the plane makes with the line in which it is moving. The bending downward of the rear edge would enlarge the angle of incidence, in that way increasing the compression of the air beneath and lifting that end of the plane. The wing warping controls are actuated by the lever at the right hand of the pilot, which also turns the rudder at the rear, that which steers the machine to right or left. The lever at the left hand of the pilot moves the elevating planes at the front of the machine. Sketch showing relative positions of planes and of the operator in the right machine. The motor has four cylinders and develops 25 to 30 horsepower, giving the machine a speed of 39 miles per hour. A newer model of the Wright machine is built without the large elevating planes in front, a single elevating plane being placed just back of the rear rudder. This arrangement cuts out the former lifting effect described above, and substitutes the depressing effect due to exposing the top of a surface to the wind. The smallest of the Wright machines, popularly called the Baby Wright, is built upon this plan, and has proven to be the fastest of all the Wright series. The Voisin Biplane While the Wrights were busily engaged in developing their biplane in America, a group of enthusiasts in France were experimenting with gliders of various types, towing them with high-speed automobiles along the roads or with swift motorboats upon the Seine. As an outcome of these experiments, in which they bore an active part, the Voisin brothers began building the biplanes which have made them famous. As compared with the Wright machine, the Voisin aeroplane is of much heavier construction. It weighs 1,100 pounds. The main planes have a lateral spread of 37 feet 9 inches and a breadth of 7 feet, giving a combined area of 540 square feet, the same as that of the Wright machine. The lower main plane is divided at the center to allow the introduction of a trussed girder framework which carries the motor and propeller, the pilot seat, the controlling mechanism, and the running gear below, and it is extended forward to support the elevator. This is much lower than in the right machine, being nearly on the level of the lower plane. It is a single surface, divided at the center, half being placed on each side of the girder. It has a combined area of 42 square feet, about half of that of the right elevator, and it is only 4 feet from the front edge of the main planes, instead of 10 feet as in the right machine. A framework nearly square in section, and about 25 feet long, extends to the rear, and supports a cellular or box-like tail, which forms a case in which is the rudder surface for steering to right or to left. A distinctive feature of the Voisin biplane is the use of four vertical planes, or curtains, between the two main planes, forming two nearly square cells at the end of the planes. At the rear of the main planes, in the center, is the single propeller. It is made of steel, two-bladed, and is eight feet six inches in diameter. It is coupled directly to the shaft of the motor, making with it 1,200 revolutions per minute. The motor is of the V-type, developing 50 horsepower and giving a speed of 37 miles per hour. Diagram showing the simplicity of control of the Voisin machine, all operations being performed by the wheel and its sliding axis. The controls are all actuated by a rod sliding back and forth horizontally in front of the pilot seat, having a wheel at the end. The elevator is fastened to the rod by a crank lever and is tilted up or down as the rod is pushed forward or pulled back. Turning the wheel from side to side moves the rudder in the rear. There are no devices for controlling the equilibrium. This is supposed to be maintained automatically by the fixed vertical curtains. Voisin biplanes at the starting line at Reims in August 1909. They were flown by Louis Paulhan, who won third prize for distance, and Henry Rougier, who won fourth prize for altitude. In the elimination races to determine the contestants for the Bennett Cup, Paulhan won second place with the Voisin machine, being defeated only by Tissandier with a Wright machine. Other noted aviators who fly the Voisin machine are M. Bunal Varela and the Baroness de la Roche. The machine is mounted on two wheels forward and two smaller wheels under the tail. This description applies to the standard Voisin biplane, which has been in much favor with many of the best-known aviators. Recently the Voisins have brought out a new type in which the propeller has been placed in front of the planes, exerting a pulling force upon the machine, 
instead of pushing it as in the earlier type. The elevating plane has been removed to the rear and combined with the rudder. A racing type also has been produced, in which the vertical curtains have been removed and a parallel pair of long, narrow ailerons introduced between the main planes on both sides of the center. This machine, it is claimed, has made better than 60 miles per hour. The first Voisin biplane was built for Delagrange and was flown by him with success. The Farman biplane. The second biplane built by the Voisins went into the hands of Henri Farman, who made many flights with it. Not being quite satisfied with the machine, and having an inventive mind, he was soon building a biplane after his own designs, and the Farman biplane is now one of the foremost in favor among both professional and amateur aviators. It is decidedly smaller in area of surface than the Wright and Voisin machines, having but 430 square feet in the two supporting planes. It has a spread of 33 feet, and the planes are 7 feet wide, and set 6 feet apart. In the Farman machine, the vertical curtains of the Voisin have been dispensed with. The forward elevator is there, but raised nearly to the level of the upper plane, and placed 9 feet from the front edge of the main planes. To control the equilibrium, the two back corners of each plane are cut and hinged so that they hang vertically when not in flight. When in motion, these flaps, or ailerons, stream out freely in the wind, assuming such position as the speed of the passing air gives them. They are pulled down by the pilot at one end or the other, as may be necessary to restore equilibrium, acting in very much the same manner as the warping tips of the right machine. A pair of tail planes are set in parallel on a framework about 20 feet in the rear of the main planes and a double rudder surface behind them. Another model has hinged ailerons on these tail planes and a single rudder surface set upright between them. These tail ailerons are moved in conjunction with those of the main planes. The Forman biplane, showing the position of the hinged ailerons when at rest. At full speed, these surfaces stream out in the wind in line with the planes to which they are attached. The motor has four cylinders, and turns a propeller made of wood, 8 feet 6 inches in diameter, at a speed of 1,300 revolutions per minute, nearly three times as fast as the speed of the right propellers, which are about the same size. The propeller is placed just under the rear edge of the upper main plane, the lower one being cut away to make room for the revolving blades. The motor develops 45 to 50 horsepower, and drives the machine at a speed of 41 miles per hour. The racing Fama is slightly different, having the hinged ailerons only on one of the main planes. The reason for this is obvious. Every depression of the ailerons acts as a drag on the air flowing under the planes, increasing the lift at the expense of the speed. Sketch of Farman machine, showing position of operator. The whole structure is mounted upon skids with wheels attached by a flexible connection. In case of a severe jar, the wheels are pushed up against the springs until the skids come into play. The elevator and the wing naps are controlled by a lever at the right hand of the pilot. This lever moves on a universal joint, the side-to-side -side movement working the flaps, and the forward and back motion, the elevator. Steering to right or left is done with a bar operated by the feet. Henri Farman carrying a passenger cross-country. Farman has himself made many records with his machine, and so have others. With a slightly larger and heavier machine than the one described, Farman carried two passengers a distance of 35 miles in one hour. The Curtis Biplane This American rival of the Wright biplane is the lightest machine of this type so far constructed. The main planes are but 29 feet in spread, and 4 feet 6 inches in width, and are set not quite 5 feet apart. The combined area of the two planes is 250 square feet. The main planes are placed midway of the length of the fore and aft structure, which is nearly 30 feet. At the forward end is placed the elevator, and at the rear end is the tail, one small plane surface, and the vertical rudder surface in two parts, one above and the other below the tail plane. Equilibrium is controlled by changing the slant of two small balancing planes, which are placed midway between the main planes at the outer ends, and in line with the front edges. These balancing planes are moved by a lever standing upright behind the pilot, having two arms at its upper end which turn forward so as to embrace his shoulders. The lever is moved to right or to left by the swaying of the pilot's body. 
The motor is raised to a position where the shaft of the propeller is midway between the levels of the main planes, and within the line of the rear edges, so that they have to be cut away to allow the passing of the blades. The motor is of the V type, with eight cylinders. It is 30 horsepower and makes 1,200 revolutions per minute. The propeller is of steel, two-bladed, six feet in diameter, and revolves at the same speed as the shaft on which it is mounted. The high position of the engine permits a low running gear. There are two wheels under the rear edges of the main planes, and another is placed halfway between the main planes and the forward rudder, or elevator. A brake, operated by the pilot's foot, acts upon this forward wheel to check the speed at the moment of landing. Another type of Curtis machine has the ailerons set in the rear of the main planes instead of between them. The Curtis is the fastest of the biplanes, being excelled in speed only by some of the monoplanes. It has a record of 51 miles per hour. The Cody Biplane The Cody Biplane has the distinction of being the first successful British aeroplane. It was designed and flown by Captain S. F. Cody, at one time an American, but for some years an officer in the British Army. It is the largest and heaviest of all the biplanes, weighing about 1,800 pounds, more than three times the weight of the Curtis machine. Its main planes are 52 feet in lateral spread and 7 feet 6 inches in width, and are set 9 feet apart. The combined area of these sustaining surfaces is 770 square feet. The upper plane is arched, so that the ends of the main planes are slightly closer together than at the center. The elevator is in two parts placed end to end, about 12 feet in front of the main planes. They have a combined area of 150 square feet. Between them and above them is a small rudder for steering to right or left in conjunction with the large rudder at the rear of the machine. The latter has an area of 40 square feet. There are two small balancing planes, set one at each end of the main planes, their centers on the rear corner struts, so that they project beyond the tips of the planes and behind their rear lines. The biplane is controlled by a lever rod having a wheel at the end. Turning the wheel moves the rudders. Pushing or pulling the wheel works the elevator. Moving the wheel from side to side moves the balancing planes. There are two propellers, set one on each side of the engine, and well forward between the main planes. They are of wood, of the two-bladed type, seven feet in diameter. They are geared down to make 600 revolutions per minute. The motor has eight cylinders and develops 80 horsepower at 1,200 revolutions per minute. The machine is mounted on a wheeled running gear, two wheels under the front edge of the main planes, and one a short distance forward in the center. There is also a small wheel at each extreme end of the lower main plane. The Cody biplane has frequently carried a passenger, besides the pilot, and is credited with a speed of 38 miles per hour. The first aeroplane flights ever made in England were by Captain Cody on this biplane, January 2, 1909. The Sommer Biplane The Sommer Biplane is closely similar to the Farman machine, but has the hinged ailerons only on the upper plane. Another difference is that the tail has but one surface, and the rudder is hung beneath it. Its dimensions are spread of main planes 34 feet, depth fore and aft 6 feet 8 inches, uh, they are set 6 feet apart. The area of the main planes is 456 square feet, area of tail 67 square feet, area of rudder 9 square feet. It is driven by a 50 horsepower gnome motor turning an 8 foot two bladed propeller. M. Sommer has flown with three passengers, a total weight of 536 pounds, besides the weight of the machine. The Baldwin Biplane The Baldwin Biplane, designed by Captain Thomas S. Baldwin, the distinguished balloonist, resembles the Forma type in some features, and the Curtis in others. It has the Curtis type of ailerons, set between the wings, but extending beyond them laterally. The elevator is a single surface placed in front of the machine, and the tail is of the biplane type with the rudder between. The spread of the main planes is 31 feet 3 inches, and their depth 4 feet 6 inches. A balancing plane of 9 square feet is set upright, like a fin, above the upper main plane on a swivel. This is worked by a fork fitting on the shoulders of the pilot, and is designed to restore equilibrium by its swinging into head resistance on one side or the other, as may be necessary. The motive power is a four-cylinder Curtis motor, 
which turns a propeller seven feet six inches in diameter, set just within the rear line of the main planes, which are cut away to clear the propeller blades. The Baddock Biplane The newest biplane of the Aerial Experiment Association follows in general contour its successful precursor, the Silver Dart, with which J. A. D. McCurdy made many records. The Baddock No. 2 is of the biplane type, and both the planes are arched toward each other. They have a spread of 40 feet, and are 7 feet in depth at the center, rounding to 5 feet at the ends, where the wing tips, 5 feet by 5 feet, are hinged. The elevator is also of the biplane type, two surfaces each 12 feet long and 28 inches wide, set 30 inches apart. This is mounted 15 feet in front of the main planes. The tail is mounted 11 feet in the rear of the main planes, and is the same size and of the same form as the elevator. The controls are operated by the same devices as in the Curtis machine. The propeller is 7 feet 8 inches in diameter, and is turned by a 6-cylinder automobile engine of 40 horsepower running at 1,400 revolutions per minute. The propeller is geared down to run at 850 revolutions per minute. The motor is placed low down on the lower plane, but the propeller shaft is raised to a position as nearly as possible that of the center of resistance of the machine. That speed attained is 40 miles per hour. A unique feature of the mechanism is the radiator, which is built of 30 flattened tubes 7 feet 6 inches long and 3 inches wide and very thin. They are curved from front to rear like the main planes and give sufficient lift to sustain their own weight and that of the water carried for cooling the cylinders. The running gear is of three wheels placed as in the Curtis machine. The Baddock No. 2 has made many satisfactory flights with one passenger besides the pilot. The Herring Biplane At the Boston Aircraft Exhibition in February, 1910, the Herring Biplane attracted much attention, not only because of its superiority of mechanical finish, but also on account of its six triangular stabilizing fins set upright on the upper plane. Subsequent trials proved that this machine was quite out of the ordinary in action. It rose into the air after a run of but 85 feet, and at a speed of only 22 miles per hour, and made a 40-degree turn at a tipping angle of 20 degrees. As measured by the inventor, the machine rose in the air with the pilot, weighing 190 pounds, with a thrust of 140 pounds, and required only a thrust of from 80 to 85 pounds to keep it flying. The spread of the planes is 28 feet, and they are 4 feet in depth, with a total supporting surface of 220 feet. A 25-horsepower Curtis motor turns a four-bladed propeller of 6 feet diameter and 5-foot pitch, designed by Mr. Herring, at the rate of 1,200 revolutions per minute. The elevator consists of a pair of parallel surfaces set upon hollow poles 12 feet in front of the main planes. The tail is a single surface. The stabilizing fins act in this manner. When the machine tips to one side, it has a tendency to slide down an incline of air toward the ground. The fins offer resistance to this sliding, retarding the upper plane, while the lower plane slides on and swings as a pendulum into equilibrium again. The Breguette Biplane The Breguette Biplane is conspicuous in having a biplane tail of so large an area as to merit for the machine the title tandem biplane. The main planes have a spread of 41 feet 8 inches and an area of 500 square feet. The tail spreads 24 feet, and its area is about 280 square feet. The propeller is three-bladed, 8 feet in diameter, and revolves at a speed of 1,200 revolutions per minute. It is placed in front of the main plane, after the fashion of the monoplanes. The motive power is an eight-cylinder REP engine, developing 55 horsepower. End of chapter 5「Six of How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air, by Richard Ferris. Chapter 6. Flying Machines. The Monoplane. In all the ardent striving of the aviators to beat each other's records, 
a surprisingly small amount of personal rivalry has been developed. Doubtless this is partly because their efforts to perform definite feats have been absorbing, but it must also be that these men, who know that they face a possible fall in every flight they make, realize that their competitors are as brave as themselves in the face of the same danger, and that they are actually accomplishing marvelous wonders, even if they do no more than just escape disastrous failure. Certain it is that each, realizing the tremendous difficulties all must overcome, respects the other's ability and attainments. Consequently, we do not find among them two distinctly divergent schools of adherents, one composed of the biplanists, the other of the monoplanists. Nor are the two types of machines separated in this book for any other purpose than to secure a clearer understanding of what is being achieved by all types in the progress toward the one common goal, the flight of man. The distinctive feature of the monoplane is that it has but one main plane, or spread of surface, as contrasted with the two planes, one above the other, of the biplane. Besides the main plane, it has a secondary plane in the rear, called the tail. The office of this tail is primarily to secure longitudinal, or fore and aft, balance. But the secondary plane has been so constructed that it is movable on a horizontal axis, and is used to steer the machine upward or downward. While most of the biplanes now have a horizontal tail plane, they were not at first so provided but carried the secondary plane, or planes, in front of the main planes. Even in the latest type brought out by the conservative Wright brothers, the former large surfaced elevator in front has been removed, and a much smaller tail plane has been added in the rear, performing the same function of steering the machine up or down, but also providing the fore and aft stabilizing feature formerly peculiar to the monoplane. Another feature heretofore distinctively belonging to the monoplane has been adopted by some of the newer biplanes, that of the traction propeller, pulling the machine behind it through the air, instead of pushing it along by a thrusting propeller placed behind the main planes. The continual multiplication of new forms of the monoplane makes it possible to notice only those which exhibit the wider differences. The Blériot Monoplane the Blériot monoplane has the distinction of being the first wholly successful flying machine. Although the Wright machine was making flights years before the Blériot had been built, it was still dependent upon a starting device to enable it to leave the ground. That is, the Wright machine was not complete in itself, and was entirely helpless at even a short distance from its starting tower, rail, and car, which it was unable to carry along. Because of its completeness, M. Blériot was able to drive his machine from Toury to Artenay, France, a distance of eight and three-quarters miles, on October 31st, 1908, make a landing, start on the return trip, make a second landing, and again continue his journey back to Toury, all under his own unassisted power. This feat was impossible to the Wright machine as it was then constructed, thus leaving the Blériot monoplane in undisputed preeminence in the history of aviation. At a little distance, where the details of construction are not visible, the Blériot machine has the appearance of a gigantic bird. The sustaining surface, consisting of a single plane, is divided into two wings made of a stiff, parchment-like material, mounted one on each side of a framework of the body, which is built of mahogany and white wood, trussed with diagonal ties of steel wire. The main plane has a lateral spread of 28 feet, and a depth of 6 feet, and is rounded at the ends. It has an area of about 150 square feet, and is slightly concave on the underside. The tailplane is 6 feet long and 2 feet 8 inches in depth, and its ends are the elevators, consisted of pivoted wing tips each about 2 feet 6 inches square with rounded extremities. The rudder for steering to left or right is mounted at the extreme rear end of the body, and has an area of 9 square feet. The body is framed nearly square in front, and tapers to a wedge-like edge at the rear. It extends far enough in front of the main plane to give room for the motor and propeller. The seat for the pilot is on a line with the rear edge of the main plane and above it. The forward part of the body is enclosed with fabric. The machine is mounted on three wheels attached to the body. Two at the front, with a powerful spring suspension and pivoted like a caster, and the other rigidly at a point just forward of the rudders. The lateral balance is restored by warping the tips of the main plane. If necessary, the elevator tips at the rear may be operated to assist in this. 
all the controls are actuated by a single lever and a drum to which the several wires are attached. The motors used on the Blériot machines have varied in type and power. In the number 11, with which M. Blériot crossed the English Channel, the motor was a three-cylinder Anzani engine, developing 24 horsepower at 1,200 revolutions per minute. The propeller was of wood, two-bladed, and six feet nine inches in diameter. It was mounted directly on the shaft and revolved at the same speed, giving the machine a velocity of 37 miles per hour. This model has also been fitted with a 30-horsepower REP re agnol Pelterie motor having seven cylinders. The heavier type, number 12, has been fitted with the 50-horsepower Antoinette eight-cylinder engine, or the seven-cylinder rotating Gnome engine, also of 50 horsepower. The total weight of the number 11 monoplane is 462 pounds without the pilot. The Antoinette monoplane. The Antoinette is the largest and heaviest of the monoplanes. It was designed by M. Levavasseur and has proved to be one of the most remarkable of the aeroplanes by its performances under adverse conditions, notably the flight of Hubert Latham in a gale of 40 miles per hour at Blackpool in October 1909. The Antoinette has a spread of 46 feet, the surface being disposed in two wings set at a dihedral angle, that is, the outer ends of the wings incline upward from their level at the body so that at the front they present the appearance of a very wide open V. These wings are trapezoidal in form, with the wider base attached to the body, where they are ten feet in depth, fore and aft. They are seven feet in depth at the tips, and have a total combined area of 377 square feet. The great depth of the wings requires that they be made proportionally thick to be strong enough to hold their form. Two trussed spars are used in each wing, with a short mast on each, halfway to the tip, reaching below the wing as well as above it. To these are fastened guy wires, making each wing an independent truss. A mast on the body gives attachment for guys which bind the whole into a light and rigid construction. The framework of the wings is covered on both sides with varnished fabric. The body is of triangular section. It is a long girder. At the front, in the form of a pyramid, expanding to a prism at the wings and tapering toward the tail. It is completely covered with the fabric, which is given several coats of varnish to secure the minimum of skin friction. The tail is 13 feet long and 9 feet wide, in the form of a diamond-shaped kite. The rear part of it is hinged to be operated as the elevator. There is a vertical stabilizing fin set at right angles to the rigid part of the tail. The rudder for steering to right or left is in two triangular sections, one above and the other below the tail plane. The entire length of the machine is 40 feet, and its weight is 1,045 pounds. It is fitted with a motor of the V-type, having eight cylinders, and turning a two-bladed steel propeller 1,100 revolutions per minute, developing from 50 to 55 horsepower. The control of the lateral balance is by ailerons attached to the rear edges of the wings at their outer ends. These are hinged and may be raised as well as lowered as occasion demands, working in opposite directions and thus doubling the effect of similar ailerons on the Farman machine, which can only be pulled downward. The machine is mounted on two wheels under the center of the main plane, with a flexible wood skid projecting forward. Another skid is set onto the tail. It is claimed for the Antoinette machine that its inherent stability makes it one of the easiest of all for the beginner in aviation. With as few as five lessons, many pupils have become qualified pilots, even winning prizes against competitors of much wider experience. The Santos Dumont monoplane. This little machine may be called the runabout of the aeroplanes. It has a spread of only 18 feet, and is but 20 feet in total length. Its weight is about 245 pounds. The main plane is divided into two wings, which are set at the body at a dihedral angle, but curve downward toward the tips, forming an arch. The depth of the wings at the tips is six feet. For a space on each side of the center, they are cut away to five feet in depth to allow the propeller to be set within their forward edge. The total area of the main plane is 110 square feet. The tail plane is composed of a vertical surface and a horizontal surface intersecting. It is arranged so that it may be tilted up or down to serve as an elevator or from side to side as a rudder. 
its horizontal surface has an area of about 12 square feet. The engine is placed above the main plane and the pilot's seat below it. The body is triangular in section, with the apex uppermost, composed of three strong bamboo poles with cross pieces held in place by aluminum sockets, and cross braced with piano wire. The motor is of the opposed type, made by Darach, weighing only 66 pounds and developing 30 horsepower at 1500 revolutions per minute. The propeller is of wood, two bladed, and being mounted directly on the shaft of the motor, revolves at the same velocity. The speed of the Santos Dumont machine is 37 miles per hour. The lateral balance is preserved by a lever which extends upward and enters a long pocket sewed on the back of the pilot's coat. His leaning from side to side warps the rear edges of the wings at their tips. The elevator is moved by a lever and the rudder by turning a wheel. While this machine has not made any extended flights, Santos Dumont has traveled in the aggregate upward of 2,000 miles in one or another of this type. The plans, with full permission to anyone to build from them, he gave to the public as his contribution to the advancement of aviation. Several manufacturers are supplying them at a cost much below that of an automobile. The REP Monoplane The Robert Esnault Pertery, abbreviated by its inventor to REP Monoplane, viewed from above, bears a striking resemblance to a bird with a fan-shaped tail. It is much shorter in proportion to its spread than any other monoplane, and the body being entirely covered with fabric, it has quite a distinct appearance. The plane is divided into two wings, in form very much like the wings of the Antoinette machine. Their spread, however, is but 35 feet. Their depth at the body is 8 feet 6 inches, and at the tips 5 feet. Their total combined area is 226 square feet. The body of the REP machine has much the appearance of a boat, being wide at the top and coming to a sharp keel below. The boat-like prow in front adds to this resemblance. As the body is encased in fabric, these surfaces aid in maintaining vertical stability. A large stabilizing fin extends from the pilot's seat to the tail. The tail is comparatively large, having an area of 64 square feet. Its rear edge may be raised or lowered to serve as an elevator. The rudder for steering to right or left is set below in the line of the body, as in a boat. It is peculiar in that it is of the compensated type, that is, pivoted near the middle of its length, instead of at the forward end. The control of the lateral balance is through warping the wings. This is by means of a lever at the left hand of the pilot, with a motion from side to side. The same lever moved forward or backward controls the elevator. The steering lever is in front of the pilot's seat, and moves to right or to left. The motor is an invention of M. Esnault Pertier, and may be of five, seven, or ten cylinders according to the power desired. The cylinders are arranged in two ranks, one in the rear of the other, radiating outward from the shaft like spokes in a wheel. The propeller is of steel, four-bladed, and revolves at 1,400 revolutions per minute, developing 35 horsepower, and drawing the machine through the air at a speed of 47 miles per hour. The Hanreau Monoplane Among the more familiar machines which have been contesting for records at the various European meets during the season of 1910, the Hanreau Monoplane earns notice for itself and its two pilots, one of them the 15-year-old son of the inventor. At Budapest, the Hanreau machine carried off the honors of the occasion with a total of 106 points for best performances, as against 84 points for the Antoinette and 77 points for the Farman biplane. A description of its unusual features will be of interest by way of comparison. In general appearance, it is a cross between the Blériot and the Antoinette, the wings being shaped more like the latter, but rounded at the rear of the tips, like the Blériot. Its chief peculiarity is in the body of the machine, which is in form very similar to a racing shell, of course with alterations to suit the requirements of the aeroplane. Its forward part is of thin mahogany, fastened upon ash ribs, with a steel plate covering the prow. The rear part of the machine is covered simply with fabric. The spread of the plane is 24 feet 7 inches, and it has an area of 170 square feet. The length of the machine, fore and aft, is 23 feet. Its weight is 463 pounds. It is mounted on a chassis having both wheels and skids, somewhat like that of the Farman running gear, but with two wheels instead of four. 
The Henriot machine is sturdily built all the way through, and has endured without damage some serious falls and collisions which would have wrecked another machine. It is fitted either with a Darach or a Clergier motor, and speeds at about 44 miles per hour. The Fitzner Monoplane The Fitzner Monoplane has the distinction of being the first American machine of the single-plane type. It was designed and flown by the late Lieutenant A. L. Fitzner, and, though meeting with many mishaps, has proved itself worthy of notice by its performances, through making use of an entirely new device for lateral stability. This is the sliding wing tip, by which the wing that tends to fall from its proper level may be lengthened by 15 inches, the other wing being shortened as much at the same time. There is no longitudinal structure, as in the other monoplanes, the construction being transverse and built upon four masts set in the form of a square, six feet apart about the center. These are braced by diagonal struts and tied with wires on the edges of the squares. They also support the guys reaching out to the tips of the wings. The plane proper is 31 feet in spread, to which the wing tips add 2.5 and feet, and is 6 feet deep, giving a total area of 200 square feet. A light framework extending 10 feet in the rear carries a tailplane 6 feet in spread and 2 feet in depth. Both the elevator and the rudder planes are carried on a similar framework, 14 feet in front of the main plane. The wings of the main plane incline upward from the center toward the tips, and are trussed by vertical struts and diagonal ties. The motor is placed in the rear of the plane, instead of in front, as in all other monoplanes. It is a four-cylinder Curtis motor, turning a six-foot propeller at 1,200 revolutions per minute, and developing 25 horsepower. The Fitzner machine has proved very speedy, and has made some remarkably sharp turns on an even keel. Other Monoplanes Several machines of the monoplane type have been produced, having some feature distinct from existing forms. While all of these have flown successfully, few of them have made any effort to be classed among the contestants for honors at the various meets. One of these, the Fairchild monoplane, shows resemblances to the REP, the Antoinette, and the Blériot machines, but differs from them all in having two propellers instead of one, and these revolve in the same direction, instead of in contrary directions, as do those of all other aeroplanes so equipped. The inventor claims that there is little perceptible gyroscopic effect with a single propeller, and even less with two. The propeller shafts are on the level of the plane, but the motor is set about five feet below, connections being made by a chain drive. The Burlingame monoplane has several peculiarities. Its main plane is divided into two wings, each ten feet in spread and five feet in depth, and set eighteen inches apart at the body. They are perfectly rigid. The tail is in two sections, each four feet by five feet, and set with a gap of six feet between the sections in which the rudder is placed. Thus the spread of the tail from tip to tip is sixteen feet, as compared with the twenty-one and a half foot spread of the main plane. The sections of the tail are operated independently, and are made to serve as ailerons to control the lateral balance, and also as the elevator. The Cromley monoplane, another American machine, is modeled after the Santos Dumont Demoiselle. It has a main plane divided into two wings, each nine feet by six feet six inches, with a gap of two feet between at the body, the total area being 117 square feet. At the rear of the outer ends are hinged ailerons, like those of the Farman biplane, to control the lateral balance. The tail is 12 feet in the rear, and is of the box type, with two horizontal surfaces and two vertical surfaces. This is mounted with a universal joint, so that it can be moved in any desired direction. The complete structure, without the motor, weighs but 60 pounds. The Chauvier monoplane is distinct in having a rigid spar for the front of the plane, but no ribs. The surface is allowed to spread out as a sail and take form from the wind passing beneath. The rear edges may be pulled down at will to control the lateral balance. It is driven by twin screws set far back on the body, nearly to the tail. The smallest and lightest monoplane in practical use is that of M. Raoul Vendôme. It is but 16 feet in spread, and is 16 feet fore and aft. It is equipped with a 12-horsepower motor, and flies at a speed of nearly 60 miles per hour. Without the pilot, its entire weight is but 180 pounds. The wings are pivoted so that their whole structure may be tilted to secure lateral balance. 
The new Moisant monoplane is built wholly of metal. The structure throughout is of steel, and the surfaces of sheet aluminum in a succession of small arches from the center to the tips. No authentic reports of its performances are available. In the Tatine monoplane, also called the Bayard Clement, the main plane is oval in outline, and the tail a smaller oval. The surfaces are curved upwards, toward the tips for nearly half their length in both the main plane and the tail. The propeller is eight and a half feet in diameter, and is turned by a Clerget motor, which can be made to develop 60 horsepower for starting the machine into the air, and then cut down to 30 horsepower to maintain the flight. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chase Landcammer. You can visit my Facebook page at Chase Landcammer Voice Artist. How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air, by Richard Ferris. Chapter 7. Flying Machines other forms. While the efforts of inventors have been principally along the lines of the successful monoplanes and biplanes, genius and energy have also been active in other directions. Some of these other designs are not much more than variations from prevailing types, however. Among these is the English row triplane, which is but a biplane with an extra plane added, the depths of all being reduced to give approximately the same surface as the biplane of the same carrying power. The tail is also of the triplane type, and has a combined area of 160 square feet, just half that of the main planes. The triplane type has long been familiar to Americans in the three-decker glider used extensively by Octave Chanute in his long series of experiments at Chicago. The quadruplane of Colonel Baden-Powell, also an English type, is practically the biplane with unusually large forward and tailplanes. The multiplane of Sir Hiram Maxim should also be remembered. Although he never permitted it to have free flight, his new multiplane modeled after the former one, but equipped with an improved gasoline motor instead of the heavy steam engine of the first model, will doubtless be put to a practical test when experiments with it are completed. Quite apart from these variants of the aeroplanes are the helicopters, ornithopters, gyropters, gyroplanes, and tetrahedral machines. Helicopters The result aimed at in the helicopter is the ability to rise vertically from the starting point, instead of first running along the ground for from 100 to 300 feet before sufficient speed to rise is attained, as the airplanes do. The device employed to accomplish this result is a propeller, or propellers, revolving horizontally above the machine. After the desired altitude is gained, it is proposed to travel in any direction, by changing the plane in which the propellers revolve to one having a small angle with the horizon. The force necessary to keep the airplane moving in its horizontal path is the same as that required to move the automobile of equal weight up the same gradient, much less than its total weight. The great difficulty encountered with this type of machine is that the propellers must lift the entire weight. In the case of the airplane, the power of the engine is used to slide the plane up an incline of air, and for this much less power is required. For instance, the weight of a Curtis biplane with the pilot on board is about 700 pounds, and this weight is easily slid up an inclined plane of air with a propeller thrust of about 240 pounds. Another difficulty is that the helicopter screws, in running at the start before they can attain speed sufficient to lift their load, have established downward currents of air with great velocity, in which the screws must run with much less efficiency. With the airplanes, on the contrary, their running gear enables them to run forward on the ground almost with the first revolution of the propeller, and as they increase their speed, the currents, technically called the slip, become less and less as the engine speed increases. In the Cornu helicopter, which perhaps has come nearer to successful flight than any other, these downward currents are checked by interposing planes below, set at an angle determined by the operator. The glancing of the currents of air from the planes is expected to drive the helicopter horizontally through the air. At the same time, these planes offer a large degree of resistance, and the engine power must be still further increased to overcome this, while preserving the lift of the entire weight. 
with an eight-cylinder Antoinette motor, said to be but 24 horsepower, turning two 20-foot propellers, the machine is reported as lifting itself and two persons, a total weight of 723 pounds, to a height of five feet, and sustaining itself for one minute. Upon the interposing of the planes to produce the horizontal motion, the machine came immediately to the ground. This performance must necessarily be compared with that of the aeroplanes, as, for instance, the Wright machine, which, with a 25 to 30 horsepower motor operating two 8-foot propellers, raises a weight of 1,050 pounds and propels it at a speed of 40 miles an hour for upward of two hours. Another form of helicopter is the Ledger machine, so named after its French inventor. It has two propellers which revolve on the same vertical axis, the shaft of one being tubular, encasing that of the other. By suitable gearing, this vertical shaft may be inclined after the machine is in the air in the direction in which it is desired to travel. The gyropter differs from the cornu type of helicopter in degree rather than in kind. In the Scotch machine, known as the Davidson gyropter, the propellers have the form of immense umbrellas made up of curving slats. The frame of the structure has the shape of a T, one of the gyropters being attached to each of the arms of the T. The axis upon which the gyropters revolve may be inclined so that their power may be exerted to draw the apparatus along in a horizontal direction after it has been raised to the desired altitude. The gyropters of the Davidson machine are 28 feet in diameter, the entire structure being 67 feet long and weighing 3 tons. It has been calculated that with the proposed pair of 50 horsepower engines, the gyropters will lift 5 tons. Upon a trial with a 10 horsepower motor connected to one of the gyropters, the end of the apparatus was lifted from the ground at 55 revolutions per minute the boiler pressure being 800 pounds, to the square inch, at which pressure it burst, wrecking the machine. An example of the gyroplane is the French Breguet apparatus, a blend of the aeroplane and the helicopter. It combines the fixed-winged planes of the one with the revolving vanes of the other. The revolving surfaces have an area of 82 square feet, and the fixed surfaces 376 square feet, the total weight of the machine and the operator is about 1,350 pounds. Fitted with a 40 horsepower motor, it rose freely into the air. The ornithopter, or flapping wing type of flying machine, though the object of experiment and research for years, must still be regarded as unsuccessful. The apparatus of M. de la Halt may be taken as typical of the best effort in that line, and it is yet in the experimental stage. The throbbing beat of the mechanism in imitation of the bird's wings, has always proved disastrous to the structure before sufficient power was developed to lift the apparatus. The most prominent exponent of the tetrahedral type, that made up of numbers of small cells set one upon another, is the signet of Dr. Alexander Graham Bell, which perhaps is more a kite than a true flying machine. The first signet had 3,000 cells and lifted its pilot to a height of 176 feet. The Signet II has 5,000 tetrahedral cells and is propelled by a 50 horsepower motor. It is yet to make its record. One of the most recently devised machines is that known as the Fritz Russ Flyer. It has two wings, each in the form of half a cylinder, the convex curve upward. It is driven by two immense helical screws, or spirals, set within the semi cylinders. No details of its performances are obtainable. End of chapter 7. Flying Machines. Other Forms. Recording by Chase Landcammer.